Hello guys, this is Jerry. So I haven't figured out which channel this will go on. I probably put it on many channels, but I got Jeff Peterson. Jeff Peterson from Geneva Supply. He is co-founder and CEO of Geneva Supply. And very briefly on how I met him, it was such a funny thing. Um, he has this program where he mentors kids in the area and he brings on people that he thinks will kind of give them some ideas, give them some good influence. And so he contacted me, it was him and Andy, and they contacted me, they said, Jerry, are you interested in speaking to them? And I thought about it, I didn't think I was qualified, but then I'm like, you know what, let's just try it. And it turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life. And in fact, I will overlay some footage to show you guys. My first channel, the channel where I would do all those pranks and all try to be awkward, I would spend a lot of time editing. I would spend a lot of time putting work into my videos and let's say they only got a few thousand views, it'd break my heart because I felt like I put so much time, it should be worth more. Jeff, welcome, man. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It was, we always try to find the interesting and intriguing, um, you know, personalities that are out there in, in not, the non-typical, you know, business type of uh, ventures for the biz tank program. So can't thank you enough. And it's, uh, it's been great to stay connected with you uh, since that time you spoke with us. Definitely. So Jeff, let's talk about your journey in entrepreneurship. How did you um, decide to do this Geneva supply? How did you come up with the name? What were you kind of more the nine to five or nine to six person before you became this kind of like CEO co-founder of Geneva supply? So I've, uh, if, if we're going to go back to just kind of figuring out what my what my business personality is and my creative personality is. Um, literally, I've I've bounced around in a lot of different industries. So right out of uh, right out of college, I was working for Jim Beam in the liquor industry because my dad was uh, uh, the president of three liquor distributorships and a VP at Jim Beam at the time. Um, so I, I got into the liquor industry for Jim Beam and bounced around in that, and uh, ended up actually buying my own sports bar and owned a sports bar for seven years. So I really knew the liquor industry um, on the uh, supply side, the distribution side, as well as the brick and mortar kind of on-premise side of life. So I really knew that industry, but I ended up selling my sports bar. And at that point, you know, I kind of looked in the mirror and said, what are you gonna do now that you have to grow up? Because the liquor industry is, it's, I mean, back then, I'm 52, so this was a while ago. Back then it was just a lot of fun. You know, and it, and it was a, a cool industry, meeting great people and going out there and, and really a, kind of an entertainment industry, so to speak. Um, so I had a, a lot of fun and, get, and learned a lot from it. Um, so sold the sports barn and I'm like, what am I going to do? And, and a buddy of mine that I managed his band um, when I was owning the sports bar said, hey, you should go work for this uh, tools supply house. And I'm like, what? I'm like a tool supply house. I don't, I don't own a tool. I'm the guy that like literally hires people to do everything like beer and pizza to hang a picture on my wall. I'm like, I don't own tools. And he's telling me to go be an outside salesperson for this tool distributorship. And, but you know, I didn't have another option. I didn't have a whole bunch of thoughts as far as what I wanted to do. So I literally um, went and interviewed with this company and uh, they offered me the job, you know, so they give me this pickup truck which I'm not a pickup truck guy um, and I'm driving around to job sites and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, really getting, um, using my personality more um, and my ability to, you know, ask good questions and, and following up with people, which is really my skill sets. And that ended up putting me as the number two salesperson at the company um, within six months. So, so that's, that's kind of where things started um, in, in the kind of traditional more, like salespeople type of a role um, where I started to manage people because within 12 months, they actually made me the sales manager. Wow. So that's, that's really where um, things kind of started to take shape for me because that's when I started to see all the different platforms that were out there and, and available. So I actually, for that, it was a family owned distributorship and for them, I actually um, negotiated the purchase of a wholesale operation that was local. And I, you know, I did that because I wanted to diversify the portfolio of that family uh, tool distributorship because wholesale means you sell B2B, so business to business. So we sold uh, power tools and hand tools and things in that tool industry to other distributors that, you know, might not have carried the brands that we had, but they wanted to satisfy their customers. And that got us outside of the state of Wisconsin and we were selling all over the country. Wow. So, so that's how um, we started doing business with Amazon.com. So um, when we took over that 
that company, I was running um, both companies. I was bouncing from both of those companies and I hired my current business partner at the time. He, you know, he was just a rep that was calling on me and I hired him to handle the day-to-day operations mm-hmm. of, that, of that operation. And, uh, and we got to be really good friends and uh, we grew that business dramatically to the point where I actually jumped over um, to handle that business full time um, because it was getting so big. And that's when we got a phone call from Amazon to say, hey, um, we need one of the brands that you guys carry because they stopped their direct relationship with us. And uh, so we actually started doing business with DeWalt, Porter Cable, and Delta Power Tools because Black & Decker ended their relationship with Amazon. So, so that's how we got introduced into the world of Amazon. So they brought us out to Seattle. They taught us everything about Amazon. And, uh, and here we are, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, we grew the business so much that we tried to actually buy into the business. Um, and they wouldn't let us buy into the business. It was a family business and they, they're just like, our dad always told us not to go into business with anybody that's not family. So we saw the writing on the wall. Um, so we got four investors, tried to buy that company, um, negotiated for about six, seven months. And, uh, we thought it was a done deal. And then on a Monday night at 8 p.m., we had um, a conference call with everybody, including the people we were buying the business from, and we were supposed to close. We had a scheduled closing for the next morning at 8 a.m., and they changed the deal. And our investors said no. And it was just a matter of, it was a way we were going to pay them. You know, they wanted all the money up front instead of in payments. And, uh, and we were, me and my you know, me and Mark Becker were like, just give them all the money. Let's do this. Let's move on. You guys have the money. Let's do this. Yeah. And they said no, basically because of principle. Wow. And so we didn't own the company. We didn't buy the company. We walked into work the next day and we got fired. Wow. <laughs> so we were instantly unemployed. Um, and that's when all of this Geneva supply thing happened. So mm-hmm. um, we called the investors and said, hey, we just got fired. And they're like, what? you guys were running the company. What, you know, how could they fire you? And we're like, well, they did. And they're like, well, what do you guys want to do? And I'm like, well, we did it once before. We'll do it again. We'll start it from scratch. Uh, one of those investors was a private jet broker. Um, so he had a 10,000 square foot empty airplane hangar. And he said, well, you guys can use that for space if you want. And all of the employees, we had eight employees at that previous company and seven of them met us for lunch that, that same day that we got fired and said, what happened? And we told them, they're like, well, we want to come and work for you guys. And we're like, we don't have a company for you to come. I mean, we, we just lost our jobs. We have a place that we're going to try to start a company, but you know, we don't need employees yet. We don't have any business. And they're like, well, we're not going back to work for, for those guys. And we're like, oh man. So if you ever, have you ever seen the movie, Jerry Maguire? Um, the one with Cuba Gooding Jr. And Tom yes, Cruise. Yes. Right? Show yeah. me the money. Yeah. yeah show me the money. Yeah. So, so, uh, when, uh, Tom Cruise in that movie gets fired. He goes over to the big fish tank and he puts a goldfish in the bag and he's, he puts it up there. He says, I'm taking this goldfish. Who else is coming with me? And nobody goes like one. I think one woman goes with him. And it was a little bit of a reverse on this because we weren't planning on saying who's coming with us. Mm-hmm. Um, but they all said, we're coming with you. Wow. So immediately there was this um, stress level of like, oh my gosh, these people want to come work for us. But there was also that that pride of, you know what, we need people. If we're going to be successful, these people are going to get us there. And uh, so we hired them all. And uh, uh, that next day we went to Best Buy and bought laptops. We went to Sprint and got cell phones. And that night, um, myself and Mark Becker, uh, we came up with the name Geneva Supply um, solely because uh, there's a touristy town in Wisconsin called Lake Geneva. Oh, and we liked the name. We shortened it up uh, to Geneva because it sounded more international. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the reason why the, the G of Geneva is a compass is because we wanted to kind of have this impression that we handled things all over the, all over the world. Mm -hmm. So we really went for the big idea, the big vibe, um, right from the get go, even though we had no business, (laughs) we had no business. Uh, we were operating out of a 10,000 square foot airplane hangar and we had a bunch of employees that we had to figure out how to, how to pay. So that's how we got into, um, the business. So I've always been, um, kind of a risk taker. Um, type of a personality and always had the confidence that if you put the right team together, you know, you're going to be able to, you know, have some level of success and get through it. 
Yeah. And something I'm getting from just hearing your story is that you obviously have very good relationships with everyone or else we wouldn't have had the situation where everyone's like, dude, I want to work for him, even though he just got fired. We know we trust him. We love him. So that's a very great skill you have. And, and that, that's one that, you know, people talk to me all the time and say, how do you have such a great um, culture and atmosphere at Geneva Supply? It, everybody seems to love working there. It's such a cool place to work. And I, I always tell people, I'm like, I can give you, if you want me to come and speak in front of a big group and talk about company culture and how to big build company culture, I can talk about it for 45 minutes or I can, I can tell you in two minutes. And the two minute version is literally, um, stop hiring based on resumes and start, start hiring people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's more important to hire the right people that fit your company than the perfect resume. Mm-hmm. You know, some, some, some jobs out there, yes, there are specific skill sets and you want the, the brightest in this skill set, et cetera. But most companies and most jobs just aren't that way. You really need the personalities to fit and be able to collaborate together. And that's where, that's kind of where the magic happens. I've had limited experience managing people, but even when I manage people, the ones that I seem to get along with the most seem to be the ones that are just like, okay, I'm not completely qualified for the job, but I want to learn. And then they become the best employees. It almost feels like the ones that are overqualified or very qualified for the position. It's almost like you're, you're almost like doing them a disfavor because they come in here, they think they know everything. They might not even want to learn that much. And then they end up usually giving you some trouble. Yeah, it's, and, and that, that's true. I, I see it often, you know, and uh, there's, there's the other side of like hiring people um, and hiring the right people is knowing if you hire a wrong person and the, the fact that you should spin that person pretty quick. Mm-hmm. You know, if you know that you hired somebody that's not a fit, um, get rid of them. You know, it's a, it, just because you offered somebody a job doesn't mean you offered them a job for life because to be perfectly honest with you, you can't expect your employees to work for you for life either. Yeah. Um, you know, they have to worry about themselves. And um, as a company, you also have to care about how individuals are affecting other individuals in the company. And, and if that person's just not um, able to kind of fit in, in a collaborative way, um, they end up kind of dragging the entire team down. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where you start getting problems. We do not have all of this, you know, um, kind of backstabbing, kind of like talking behind each other's backs because everybody truly believes in each other and truly believes everybody knows what everybody's role is and, you know, who to go to for what. So it's, it's, been, it's been very, very good. Now, I'm not going to lie, the, the more we've grown, it's, it's hard to grow fast with, with employees. You know, we've, mm-hmm. we've basically been doubling the number of employees and staff that we've had um, year over year, you know, so we've got 130 employees now. So um, it's been, it's been pretty crazy. And we've got three locations. We, we have our corporate headquarters in Delavan, Wisconsin. Um, that's our largest uh, logistics facility as well. That's hundred I think it's like 190,000 square feet. We have a 60,000 square feet, uh, square foot uh, facility in Charleston, South Carolina and a 60,000 square foot facility in Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, not only do we have um, a lot of employees, we've got multiple locations. So, you know, there's challenges in it. It's, we're not perfect. You know, I, I don't want you to think that everything we do, you know, it, you know, we touch it and it turns to gold and every employee we hire is a rock star because that's just simply not the fact but we do know who we want and we are fitting people in and we have a pretty high success rate on it. I also want to emphasize that on the employee end, this is something important too. A lot of employees almost like overstay when they know whatever position is not right. So for employees at a company, you know, when you feel like it's time to go, um, make your plans of course, but go, or even like that first month, if that first month doesn't feel right, just Go to something else. It's so funny. Totally Just from agree. my experience, um, a lot of times that first month I'm working at a company, other companies are, are trying to get me to work for them too. So like it's very, very, uh, very, very rare for me to only have one thing that first month. So like that first month, if you feel like it doesn't work out, just go to another place and then just don't put that company in your resume, the place you left in like two weeks. It's just, sure, if it's going right. to make you happier, you know, make you better as an employee, do it. I probably do something that's a little obscure. I don't know if there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if there's a lot of other people that, that do this during the interview process. 
Um, I literally, um, for, for pretty much every level employee, at some point in the conversation, it'll come out that I tell them that Geneva Supply is going to look great on your resume because you're going to get so many different experiences and so much variety and you're going to get exposed to so many different um, aspects of business and you're going to be part of a fast moving company and things that we're doing and growing and, and you're going to be asked to sit in meetings to collaborate and come up with new ideas and help finalize things and we're going to look great on your resume and they always say what do you mean uh, you know Jimmy Geneva's pie is gonna look great on my resume I'm like I have zero expectation that you're going to retire from Geneva supply and you're going to be boosting who you are as a talent in the workforce while working at Geneva Supply. And it is my job to make sure that you're elevated and you look better in a year from now on your resume and people want to steal you from Geneva Supply. I want everybody to want my employees. Now, a lot of people would say, oh my gosh, that's stupid because then you're gonna have to pay them more to get them to stay. And that's just not true. People wanna stay where they want to be. And it's not always just about the money. And if, if I, you know, I'm going to pay people based on what our company can afford to pay somebody at the role that they're in. And if I can't afford to pay them more and they can do the same role someplace else and they think that they'll be happy there and that's what's right for their family, then they should go. And, and I don't have any false expectation or think that they're being disloyal. If they do that, there's a lot of reasons to stay at a company and there's a lot of reasons to leave a company. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had employees that have left um, and I, I congratulated them. And I thought, you know, for that, for that, pay, I had somebody leave because they had a $15,000 offer that was higher than what we were paying. And a week and a half later, they came back to Geneva Supply. Wow. And that, that happened five months ago. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, and those things happen. I was really, really happy for that person because that was a really good opportunity for their family. And I couldn't match that money. You know, I couldn't match at the time of what the role was and everything. I couldn't match it. So, um, so it's, it's okay to um, have somebody building their resume. Cause I also want um, the people at Geneva supply to, you know, start to focus on their own personal brand as well. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not owned by Geneva supply. I want them out there putting out their own content, putting out their own video, because if people follow them and they become thought leaders, everybody's going to look at the fact that they work at Geneva Supply, so that benefits me. Yeah. So I'm going to let them do video content during the day if it's on a topic that we handle at Geneva Supply, even if it's elevating them as an individual. So it's just that's just my philosophy on it. Yeah, absolutely. And... That is just great. And I know there's other companies that will try to like dangle a potential promotion or something like that to keep their employees. And you know, that, that just ultimately bites them, bites them. So it's like, yeah. I like what you do. It's just like, we care about the employees. We also know you're probably not going to be here for life. Let's all just be honest and help each other. I love it, man. I'm buddies with a guy out there um, named Jesse Cole. He's the owner of the Savannah Bananas and um, he's got a company called Fans First. And a big thing about what he's uh, doing is basically saying, hey, get rid of all the things that your customers and employees hate. Why do you keep on doing things that, that people don't like? Why are you doing things the same way everybody else is doing it? And I, I never really kind of realized it, but that's what we, that's what we do. You know, we, we, you know there's, there's just no reason to have expectations or ownership feeling over over employees or forcing your personality on somebody else and saying they have to be a certain way if it's just not their personality. So it's, it's, it's worked for us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for audiences that are not familiar with Geneva supply, what kind of um, B2B do you guys do? What kind of um, services, what kind of goods do you guys provide? Yeah. So, so we're, we're a little bit of a niche company, but we're in the largest um, category of business going on right now. So we are in the e-commerce world but we handle manufacturers to the e-commerce platforms. The, obviously the main platform for e-commerce is Amazon. So Amazon is the majority of our business for the brands that we represent and handle. Um, but we do handle about 65 other e-commerce platforms as well. Um, so when I mentioned those locations, those warehouse locations, we also have third-party logistics. So 
Um, we actually touch product. We repackage, we label kit. We do that kind of stuff. And we'll ship, we'll ship to brick and mortar re retailers for manufacturers. We'll ship direct to consumer for different e-commerce platforms that don't bring inventory into their warehouses. Um, we'll ship to the Amazon fulfillment centers and we'll also um, operate on all the different seller platforms that Amazon offers. The other thing that we do obviously is uh, we handle all the content. So we, we manage and build out the content and optimize the content on the Amazon platform um, as well as we have a digital marketing division that handles all of digital marketing on Amazon as well as off Amazon um, and uh, partner with companies that way. So we really are um, kind of set up as a one-stop shop for manufacturer for e-commerce strategy. And there's, we, we kind of run everything as an a la carte. So whatever the pain point is for the manufacturer, we can actually kind of solve those pain points where they don't have to do every, you know, jump in and do everything that we do with us, but they can do the different aspects that are pain points for them and we can kind of grow with them. Wow, that is so interesting. So it's almost like, you know, in, in a normal consumer's mind, they think of like the manufacturer, they think of maybe like a third party, like an Amazon, and then the consumer, or maybe like a brick and mortar store. So what you guys do, I'm, I'm totally gonna draw an image with my hand. You guys are almost yep. like the surrounding packaging around like the third party, the Amazon. Like all this stuff from here to here, from here to here, you guys are kind of like provide a lot of that stuff that people don't normally think about. Everybody thinks about it in a way that they know it's got to get done. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't necessarily have the capability of being efficient or have the experience or expertise to do it the most profitable way they can. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we make money. So we're a, we're, we're a company that costs a manufacturer to use us. But it's, we're a lot more reasonable than for them to have to figure everything out on their own and, and change it. Because if a manufa manufacturers like to make large quantities of product and ship in pallet quantities, they don't want to ship one screwdriver to, to a, you know, a retailer or, and they don't want to ship direct to consumer. And that's what the e-commerce platform is, is doing. And that's why it's so challenging for a lot of manufacturers. So a lot of manufacturers just flat out have, if they're importing their goods, that's why we have a location in Charleston and Phoenix. Um, we have the containers come right to our warehouse facilities. We're their storage facility. We handle their e-commerce, but we also handle the logistics to their brick and mortar retailers for them as well. So um, we've grown into a lot of things based on what the needs were of the manufacturers as we kind of talk to them about their strategies. And the one thing that's really good about what you guys do is you guys are evolving with kind of where this world is going. You know, everything's digital, everything's automated, everything's just, everything's online in the cloud, so to speak. And you guys are providing essential services for everyone that's trying to figure this whole entire ecosystem out. And there's, there are companies um, that have been doing business direct with Amazon for years. Um, but they've been struggling and challenged with it for years. They're getting tons of chargebacks. It's um, their operation system doesn't fit. They're, you know, they're not able to hit ship windows. And there's the, you know, the compliance regulations on Amazon is changing every six months. So it's it's very difficult because e-commerce is changing rapidly to try to create their own efficiencies, and their efficiencies are not are, are challenges to manufacturers. So our greatest strength, we always say, has been our flexibility in the way that we've grown. So when you talk about evolving, um, we've, that's all we've done. Our whole business mindset from, from day one, because um, when you start and you have no business, you'll do just about what anybody wants you to do, you know, to keep cash flow going and get and hit payroll. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, our mindset was that way from the very, very beginning. Um, the other mindset we had back in the day was we knew that we were going to be a lean company. We weren't going to have enough employees to do the amount of work that we needed done. So we were always a laptop company. So when I said we went to Best Buy and got laptops, that's what we did. We got laptops because we knew that if people called in sick, we still might need them to jump on their computer and help us do something while they're you know in bed sick. If they went on vacation, we, we wanted them to take their laptop with them. And if they worked for two hours on their vacation, we would give them one of their vacation days back. Sure, you know, we, awesome. But we just, we just needed them. We needed to know they were going to be there if we needed them. So we always had this remote capability and mindset for employees because of the size and the way that we were running so lean. So when this whole COVID-19 thing happened, 
um, and the remote working happened, every single office employee literally just said, okay, well, if it's going to be a month, I'm going to take my big monitor off my desk and take that with me. Yeah. But, but it, it was like, no, but we didn't even have to, okay, well, we've got to get a VPN. We've got to get all this stuff set up and you know, we've got to get different logins and oh, how are we going to do this in the security aspect? And it, we didn't have to deal with any of that. It was literally just like make the decision. Boom. Everybody was working home from home, you know, an hour and a half later. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that we kind of lucked out. Um, just because of the way that we were thinking before when it comes to these types of challenges that pop up. And, and again, there's companies out there right now um, that were very challenged with this remote working concept. Mm -hmm. They just weren't set up properly for it. And, and I, I think that's the way manufacturers are, are looking at this e-commerce world. They, they get it. They want to be part of it. And some of them are doing it, but some of them are doing it, it inefficiently because it just does it's like square peg in a round hole in their system you know so that's that's where we've come into play and that's where that's why it's been a successful 10 and a half years i don't put as much time as how much it pays off so basically let's say i only spent 20 minutes on a video then if it only gets let's say 10,000 views i'm not i'm not sad so if you get what i mean it's like you you tamper your expectations a little you're not trying to make you know, um, Avatar or some movie, right? You're just making you're just making content that people, let's say, you know, they're having lunch, they want to take five minutes, or maybe you know they're in the bathroom, they're watching it. So the other thing I would love to talk to you about is the the Biz Tank, the the great mentorship you have for kids. I was so happy you know, after I came on and you know talked to the students you were mentoring because I felt like it was so awesome. I mean, I wish I had something like that in high school. So tell me about how you came up with that or you and your team came up with that. I never thought about mentoring. I always coached. So I always coached um, sports. I always coached like eighth grade uh, basketball, volleyball, baseball, football, uh, JV, basketball, that kind of stuff. So I was always a coach. But when we started Geneva Supply, I had to give up coaching because if, if you've ever you know, done a startup that you know, consumes you, I was not able to coach anymore because I couldn't make practices um, and I just couldn't follow through on the commitment. So I had to quit coaching, which was, uh, which was a huge, you know, kind of a, a passion of mine. So in 2016, um, Entrepreneur Magazine ranked us number 29 out of 360 up and coming companies across the country. And I, I say nobody knew we existed. Nobody knew Geneva Supply existed. And that kind of gave us what I call street cred um, where, uh, all of a sudden, the local high school calls up and said, hey, can you guys come in and share your, your journey of, of Geneva Supply and tell us all about this? And, you know, I was talking to, you know, Becker, my business partner, I go, I go, man, what are we, what are we going to talk about that these kids are going to give a shit about? You know, and it, are they just going to be happy that they don't have to listen to their teacher that day? You know, it's like this, <laughs> that whole substitute teacher mentality. So we went in there and we started kind of talking about our journey. And you'd expect the kids to have been told the day before, okay, what questions are we going to ask? We've got to make sure that we respect their time. And, you know, okay, Tommy, you ask this question. Okay, Susie, you ask that question. And we're kind of expecting that, you know? So we walk in and we start talking and all these hands are going up. But the questions that they're asking had everything to do about with what we were just talking about. They were asking like deeper questions and, and they were asking how, why we did that and why we did this and how did this benefit us and would we have done it different? And, and I'm just sitting there, you know, answering these questions. I'm like, I never would have asked these questions when I was in high school. I, I wouldn't have raised my damn hand, you know? It's, so, and I just got this, this feeling that these kids actually were relating to it and were really intrigued and interested in it. Yeah. And that's when it kind of hit me. So after it was all said and done, I came up with this, this need and this thought that the high school curriculum, it is what it is. It's, it's set up in a structured way that we're trying to give kids across the country a balance of knowledge in different aspects of, of, uh, of coursework, et cetera. And we're expecting teachers to be good at teaching everything. And these kids are being asked when they're juniors and seniors in high school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're having to make decisions. Do I want to go to college? Uh, if I go to college, what do I want to major in? And if I go to college, how much am I going to be in debt 
from going to college. It's some of the most expensive debt you can go in. And these kids have no idea why they're even going to a college yeah. or why they're going into this major or that major or what career they're picking. Yeah. And that's when it kind of hit me that society has been kind of asking the same question for decades and decades and decades, and we're not doing anything to change it. And that's when I came up with BizTank. And BizTank is all about career exploration. It's about connecting kids to different thought leaders, industry leaders, different people that have different journeys so that these kids can actually ask questions just like they were asking us questions and learn through other people's experiences and get these kids connected and understanding. That's how they're going to figure out what they want to be by asking other people what they do. When they walk into a company and they see somebody, ask them, so what is it exactly that you guys do? You know, what do you do here at the company? And how, how did you end up getting this job? Did you go to college for this? And, and give them that power, actually empower these kids that this is their journey. And it's not a guidance counselor's journey. And in fairness, it's not their parents' journey. Their, you know, their parents aren't going to live their, their life through their kids for the rest of their lives. You know, and and it's, it, they have to do what they want to do for the reasons why they want to do it. And that's what we're about. We're about exposing these kids. So we, we run three seasons, one in the uh, fall, one in the winter, and one in the spring. And they're eight Wednesday nights long. And we have speakers um, from all over the country, all different industries, everything that's unique. And we have them come in. We have them talk about where their head was when they were in high school um, and their journey. Did they go to college? Did they not go to college? Do they wish they didn't go to college? You know, how did they pay their debt off? What were their successes, their failures? Why did they leave a $175,000 job for a $100,000 job? What made them unhappy? You know, all of those things that kids aren't exposed to and all these different careers so they can figure out what they want to be. And, some, and sometimes it's because they figure out what they don't want to be, you know, that type of a thing. So that's what BizTank is. It's a scholarship program. So if a kid comes seven out of the eight Wednesday nights, um, they get a scholarship towards continuing education. Wow. So they can, start as, they can start as early as they're going into their junior year. And uh, so they can keep their seat. All they need to get into it is a letter of recommendation from somebody that's not a parent or a teacher. Um, and then to keep their seat for the next season, they have to do two hours of community service and, and a job shadow. And they have to keep doing two hours of community service and a job shadow to keep keep their seat if they want to stay in for all six available seasons to them. And uh, the, the kicker is for the community service, they're not allowed to do it at the same organization. And that's why I only make it two hours because, you know, if they go to do something for two hours, odds are they're going to stay longer and it's going to be because they've chosen to. And I want them to do it at different community uh, organizations because they don't really know what all the needs are in their community. And by having them have to bounce around, they're going to figure out the things that they like and what connects to them personally. And the same thing on job shadows. They're, if they wanted to be a physical therapist, they can go to a job shadow with a physical therapist for their first one, but they can't job shadow another physical therapist. They can do something in the medical field, but not a physical therapist. And I want them to start realizing they should have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a D, E, F, whatever it is, because they start hearing these people's journeys and they realize that none of them are doing what they thought they were going to do. I was wondering what you would like your career path to be in like five years, five, ten years. What do mm -hmm. you see yourself doing? So um, my answer is probably not exactly what you're looking for, but this is what I'll say. Um, right now I generate a lot of what's called passive income. Basically it's like um, the income comes to me whether, whether I do much work or not. Um, like, for example, people who write a book, they have passive income or let's say like me, I have lots of videos on YouTube. So even if I don't post anything for a while, I'll still make some money. So I want more sources of passive income because the more sources of passive income I have, the more I can do things I really want to do and not have to worry about, oh, where do I eat tomorrow? So I want more passive income and I want to be um, where the trends are. So, you know, the latest in technology, the latest in what's going on in the world. And of course, you know, China's rising. So I want to have something um, in China, whether it's just be an influencer in China too, or do other kinds of business, maybe even teach or mentor people. So it's, it's more broad, like a five-year plan, but that's kind of where I see it now. So what makes them so different to think that they're going to have it all figured out? And, uh, and that's all part of it. When I went to college, it was already 
very few people stayed at a job for let's say longer than five years. But now with the Zoomers, I guess they're called Generation Z, it's even more because things are so much more fast paced and more and more economies are merging and falling. So for them, it's very unlikely for any of them to stay at a job for more than five years. So yeah, it's, it's totally something to think about. And the big thing too is, you know, I want to try to kind of narrow their choices down because they are about ready to make a, a massive decision on whether they go to college and, and, and that, that debt's real. You know, that is a huge expense. And, and I also want them to realize that if they're in their freshman year or sophomore year and they decide they don't like the major that they picked, then change it. Yeah, change you know, it. But they, the, so many kids feel that stress and that anxiety and that pressure that it's, fail, it's a, you know, a sign of failure to have to change your mind and change your direction. And then they also start looking at the cost of the, you know, how much longer they're going to have to stay in school if they change their major. Yeah. So there's so many kids that get, you know, get a degree in something that they actually don't want a degree in and don't want to work in that field, but they were too afraid to change their major. They didn't want to upset their parents. They didn't want to go to school longer and they didn't want it to have like that sign of failure, you know, and so many kids are in that mindset. And I hope that going through biz tank, it's not just about when they're in high school. It's about later on in life when they, when they can like see some of these things in front of them and realize, listen, I, you know, I, I don't like where I'm at right now or, or, you know, I don't care about the money. It's, it's about my happiness. It's about this. And, and some of the stuff that they're getting, you know, exposed to and learning about now, I think it, they're life lessons. They're not just for juniors and seniors. Yeah. I don't know if this has been explicitly encouraged, but I saw that after I came on BizTank, a lot of the kids actually added me on LinkedIn and Instagram and stuff like that. That's awesome. Like that's something yeah. that they should definitely do. You have, yep. you, you realize this a lot of times in this world, it is, you know, it's, it's not always just about your qualifications. Um, it totally. goes back to the beginning of the conversation again. A lot of it is about human relationships, right? If someone likes you, they'll just want to talk to you more. They want to help you out more. And the quicker they realize it's all about a network in life and it's all about friendships and stuff like that, the, the quicker they realize that the more ahead they'll get. Because I think um, any kid that comes to the biz tank, you know, they probably tend to be like hardworking, motivated kids. You know, they at least want to seek advice. A lot of times in high school, you get distilled this kind of belief, you know, you know, academic dishonesty, dishonesty is bad. This, that is bad. But the real world is more complex, right? Right. Um, you can talk to some of like the best business owners. They probably cheated their way through high school and college. Yeah. And then, you know, for me, maybe 10 years ago, I would have been really mad. But now I'm like, okay, well, they figured out a different way, right? And they're still creating value. So what's to say they did right. it wrong? I'm not telling people to cheat, okay? I'm I, I, was, I, was a, I was a C student. I say this all the time. Yeah. I, I was not... Like people say, oh, tell me the, you know, as a CEO, you know, they, they say, oh, CEOs should read five to 10 books a year or whatever. I don't read any books. Literally, literally I don't read yeah, books. Me neither. I don't read books I, either. I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm writing, I'm writing two books right now. Um, but I don't read, I don't read books because part of, part of me is, you know, when somebody writes a business book, I never wanted to like read it and change the way I was. You know, I wanted to, I, I know the network of people that are around me um, and I've built that network and those mentors and the people that I can confide in that know who I am, know my personality so that when I go ask them a question, they're going to give a response based on me, based on what they know I'm capable of, what, how driven I am this way, how lazy I might be that way, you know, all of those things. And that's what I really kind of, tell people to do. It's like surround yourself with, with people that you can ask questions to. Like now, like you're in some of these kids circles and, and literally that's who you should start to build out to. You don't have to go read a book to figure out how to do something. You have people all over this country that have done it or know somebody that has learning how to network and not being afraid to ask questions and reaching out to people. That's more important than any skill set or anything you're going to learn in high school or college. Jerry, did you ever have a mentor yourself when you were younger? I had people who tried to be my mentor, but they honestly did not lead me down any good path. So what I would say about the whole mentor thing is be careful of people who want to be your mentor. Sometimes the people who want to be your mentor or the people you don't want as your mentor. Sometimes the people who you want as mentor, you have to go seek them out and go ask them. Another great part of what you're encouraging kids to do is also what you realize is 
a lot of like the networks and a lot of the mentoring and stuff is also not really completely going to be good for your own personality. So it's, it's important early on in a kid's development to realize, okay, this is who I am and not all advice is created equal, but the kid has to be able to understand that by experiencing a lot of different types of mentorship, a lot of different types of people. And then they'll realize, okay, this type of person might work for this person, but not for me. Right. Exactly. And that's, and that's important. And it's, and it's, and that's where the kids need to start to feel more empowered instead of just going through the motions. And once they start to feel that, you know, the kids that started in our biz tank program from the first season are completely different kids after their first season, their second season, their third season. I get, I get messages. I get Facebook messages, LinkedIn messages, um, emails from biz kids from, past years or, or from the same seasons, just reaching out, asking me a question or, you know, you know, thanking me for, you know, the time that I put into biz tank because it was one of their, you know, most empowering, you know, things that they did in, in school and, and giving them the confidence to, you know, try things in college or go for this organization or run for like student council president and this and that because they were so scared to talk to people before. And, and they understand that, you know, trying things is, is really important and, and, and you're not going to always nail everything that you do. And I, you know, you've heard it before, you know, fail fast, mm -hmm. you know, it be, be aware of when you do something or if you go a direction, if you, if it feels right, keep going. If it feels wrong, Take a quick second and step back and say, hmm, is this really what I want to do? And if you don't, get out of it. Go someplace else. There was a, there was a speaker and I, you know, it was, he said something that kind of stuck to me and it's, it's a little obscure. He said, listen, if you take a car, let's say you own a car and you fill it, absolutely fill it to the brim with Skittles and you get in that car and you drive all around the country until that car is empty of Skittles because you're just eating them one by one, you're driving around all over the place, just experiencing life. And it could take you three years to eat all those Skittles and you come back and all you did was drive around for three years and eat Skittles. You will not have lost traction on what you're going to be for the rest of your life. You would have gone out and experienced things that other people haven't experienced. So everything that you do, no matter what you do or how you do it, as long as you're not just sitting your ass on the couch and doing nothing, you know, you're going to be getting experiences that in some fashion are going to benefit you and build who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. Dude, I love it, man. I love it. Um, me personally, I didn't start kind of like connecting with people and asking people for advice until late in college. So um, the fact that the kids would go through biz tank, um, they get to do it like four or five years before I started realizing, man, that is just, I, you know, that's one of those things I wish I did more. So yeah. Right. 100% good things to say about that program you guys created. Yeah, it's fun. And what, what's, uh, what's interesting now, because this COVID-19 has put a halt to our uh, spring season, um, and the team, you know, all of us with, you know, that make BizTank what it is, we all, we all kind of talked and said, these kids need it more than they ever did. They just yeah. had school ripped out from underneath them. And, you know, all, all they really have – for mentorship and guidance are like their teachers, their guidance counselor, and their parents. Um, and luckily, you know, they consider biz tank as part of that as well, mm -hmm. but they just had a huge part of that ripped out from underneath them. And they're having to figure out how to do school online. And they're, so, you know, some of these kids are seniors that have just lost their sports, lost everything, lost their graduation, lost their proms, lost this, lost that. And, and it's, it's a, it's a big, you know, emotional, anxiety filled time for them. And we said now is it's more important to do biz tank now than probably it ever has been. So we, we developed and created um, and said, we're not going to give up on biz tank in our keynote speaker series. And literally we're still going to do it. So we've been doing um, the biz tank speaker series through zoom webinar. Wow. Um, and now we're, we're live streaming it um, across the country. So more kids can actually be exposed to it. So any kid that's in high school or college across the country just has to register, you know, to watch on Wednesday night, 6 30 PM central standard time, and they register and they can watch the speakers and we run it the same way. It's just all through zoom. And, uh, and we're even opening it to like, Jerry, you could register like parents, friends, 
um, college professors, business people um, can, can watch these speakers because they're, the speakers are telling their journey and their story and flat out it's uplifting and inspiring to hear just the variety of things that are going on out there. And it's interesting versus just watching Netflix all day, yeah, you know? Exactly. So, so that's uh, that's what we've been doing. So we've got some fantastic speakers, um, you know, that we're doing through zoom webinars. So it's been fun. Wow. Um, definitely send me the link to all that. So sure. if anyone, watches yeah, and, and if one, anybody wants to, they can go to um, our website, which is, uh, biztanknonprofit.org, mm-hmm. um, or they can go to any of our social uh, media platforms, Biz Tank Nonprofit, you know, okay. and, and the links are on there. We're all constantly promoting it. Um, so it's out there. So it'd be awesome to have anybody that's listening to this or anybody that follows you to all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we have 200 Jerry Lou followers that are registering for Biz Tank on Wednesday night. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be awesome. Following up on this advertising thing, is there any type of ad that you really wish you saw more? And then are there any types of ads that you just are so sick of seeing, you don't ever want to see them again? I think for me, I like to see ads that are local businesses. You know, I really Mm -hmm. don't want to um, order something that is from a different country and it takes forever. That's just kind of um, a setback. But I have never seen an ad for a local business, and I think that that's something that I'm more interested in. I think that I would like to see more, like, ads towards stuff that I'm into compared to, like, the house, like, come buy a house or, like, mortgages Mm -hmm. or, like, the credit card stuff. Mm -hmm. I would rather see more of the stuff that I'm into than all that. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with... um Cat, mm-hmm. yep, cat. I'm just checking with cat because I want to see stuff about the community, like about the voting. I did not see a single post about voting and stuff. And I know maybe it was overkill. A lot of people were posting stuff, but instead I see advertisements for McDonald's and huge name brand stuff. I rather see really local, community oriented stuff. I I continually see like ads for games, and it's always the same game. It needs to change. <laughs> it almost just feels like this whole biz tank thing, um, eventually it might get become such a beast in itself. And then, yeah. I don't know, I just feel like down the line, you might have to make the decision. It's like, do I do like devote my time to Geneva Supplier? Is, it, is biz tank just my thing? I, I just get that feeling in the future. Well, I, I'll tell you, a lot of people say that to me. Um, there's no doubt that biz tank is an absolute ultimate passion for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm lucky that I have amazing uh, team members at Geneva Supply that are unbelievably capable of of doing their jobs, and I can I can manage them accordingly, and and still be able to figure out how to keep this biz tank going. I've got there's you know four or five people at Geneva Supply mm-hmm. that put their own time in um, outside of Geneva Supply to keep this biz tank thing going because it is it is that important. It is that cool. And I really hope so. I hope someday, um, someday soon, I hope BizTank is, is that powerful and that cool. And, and, you know, with this Zoom webinar going live across the country, that could turn into something huge because we were going to live stream. We had, we had it all figured out on how to live stream and we couldn't do it through the platform that we had already chosen. Um, and we already did beta testing because we have to be in our production studio to use that software. Um, so that's why Zoom webinar kind of stepped in and, and is working for us, but it is giving us the confidence that we can put a quality, entertaining, inspiring, um, and journey-filled program out there um, for people that are just kind of tuning in on their cell phones, uh, their laptops, or, you know, and and it's great content because we put all of the speakers um, on our uh, website so that teachers can actually take that speaker and watch that video in in a classroom you know, the next day in their class for, for relevant content, because it's so hard for these kids to connect um, outside the classroom to businesses and, and these speakers that, you know, we videotape and um, do all of that. So, so it's been cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something even I might do in the future too, just on my channel, I might look at some of your other speakers and maybe like jot some notes down and do a reaction or a critique video. I think that'd be really fun. Super cool. We, we're so lucky that, you know, the speakers have, have stayed connected and, and still cared about the program and still speak highly of, of their experience and their exposure to it. Um, so it's been fun. And, you know, Jason Pfeiffer, the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazines, um, was the first speaker we ever had. 
and he's been the MC for our uh, Biz360 fundraiser, which is our business conference we do. And he is a, he's a big fan of the program. And, and having the level, that level of, you know, um, personality that's out there, you know, loving the program and, and you're seeing the same thing. It's, it's, it's what society needs. It's what kids need. And more and more businesses need to start to realize this is the future and they should start connecting and networking earlier um, with, with these students. Yeah, exactly. So um, Jeff, last question. Um, as yeah. for Geneva supply, um, yeah. you guys are doing well. You guys are um, yeah. well supplied under this current situation. That's right. But yeah, we are. What's the plan next? Let's say for next year or whatever. Do you guys potentially will expand even more or maybe go to other countries? What, what, what do you think will happen to Geneva supply? Yeah, so this COVID-19 thing is doing, um, doing a lot for a lot of different companies. You know, some are, are doing very, very well um, through it because of the challenges and people, you know, being remote and, and sheltered in place and all that kind of stuff. There's companies that are doing, you know, are really struggling, people that are out of work and everything. But what you have to realize is that domino of people being at home and literally not being able to go out and shop the way they used to. The e-commerce platform is, there's just rapid growth of users. So people that kind of used Amazon in the past are using it like crazy now. People that never used it, which, you know, who the hell doesn't use Amazon? <laughs> there's still, I suppose there's still those people out there. The, the traffic to Amazon and to the e-commerce platforms, it's proving itself to manufacturers that they've really got to focus and figure it out. So what that's doing for Geneva Supply is it's, it's elevating our timeframes of, of what we have to do and, and where we have to go. So we're staring at right now um, in the next 18 to 24 months, um, we'll open a location in the upper Northeast and the upper Northwest um, because logistics, you know, freight's a big deal. It's freight's the most expensive part of e-commerce and we have to be close to the doorsteps of the consumer. Yeah. So by doing that, if you kind of look at the heat map from UPS or FedEx, that will give us the ability to ship direct to consumer in that two days um, freight, which Amazon has kind of made a big deal with their prime. Yeah. Um, and all the other e-commerce platforms are chasing that. So what we see is, is growing in the logistics side to be closer to the doorsteps of the consumers to hit those um, two day freight terms. Um, but also uh, growing in that digital marketing because more and more companies are going to start taking their budgets and going after the e-commerce platforms. Um, so that's going to be a big play for us. The crazy thing is um, four or five years ago, we started a paint brand called Prestige Paints and we got it up. We were, ex we're exclusive on Amazon for interior and exterior paint. We created an app called Prestige Color Pick, C-O-L-O-R-P-I-C so that you could pick your color on the app instead of using color swatches that you go in the brick and mortars and grab and everything's driven to Amazon for, for paint. So we were, we were just, we, we've got this great setup. It's all on Amazon and Amazon wasn't screaming to their consumers that they sold paint because they weren't ready for it. Well, uh, last week they uh, created a thing called the color selector or Ooh. I think it's color selector or paint selector. Um, and they just went live with it last week. But when this COVID-19 thing hit, we went from averaging 30 to 50 gallons of paint a day. Now we're averaging 530 gallons of paint a day because wow. all these people are at home trying to figure out how to do their projects. So again, what's happening in our world to our business is the exposure and necessity of e-commerce is so condensed right now that what we thought was going to happen two years from now, as far as growth is going to happen in the next six to 12 months. Wow. You know, it, so we have to, we have to be ready for it. Um, and manufacturers have to adapt for it too. So, so that's what we're really kind of focusing on right now. You know, it's, it's what does that look like for us and how quickly do we need to get certain things in place and, and, uh, hoping that we're ready for it. Yeah. It's so interesting because, um, an example in China, and China had this even before COVID, is that most social media platforms, the express purpose of, let's say, their version of a YouTube was to sell products e-commerce wise. So most influencers would have a direct link, not an affiliate link, but like a direct link to an e-commerce part of the video platform. 
So, yep. you know, that's going to be a little bit difficult because YouTube and Amazon are kind of competitors, but maybe what Amazon might do, just a thought of mine, and maybe if anyone from Amazon watches this, maybe they can make this happen. Amazon's going to really invest in their, like, not like their professional quality video creators, but they're like user-based kind of ecosystem creators. And that way, because e-commerce is already so big on Amazon, they can fulfill that direct brand influencer content creator to um, shopping type of thing that China already has. That could be something. I'm just, this is just completely there is it, there's, on how the, China's working. I love it because there's a part of Amazon and they started it, I think it was like six months ago. Um, it's called Amazon Live. And so they, you can stream a live video to a specific product on the platform so that you can almost do like an infomercial. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there are influencers that manufacturers are hiring to come in and talk about their products and they're, they're marketing it on their social media platform saying, Hey, at 10 AM central standard time, you know, click this link and it'll take you to Amazon. We're going to talk about this new product that we're launching. So they're getting they're dabbling in it. You know, they're, they're kind of getting an understanding the importance of that emotional connection, you know, that personality connection um, to the consumer because there's so much video content that's being consumed. So they're trying to take from just that flat uh, traditional read the verbiage, read the specs, the product description, and they're trying to enhance their content a little bit through that Amazon live. So wow. I don't know what the specs are as far as, how successful it's been and how many people are using it, but they're, they're going to figure something out. Cause I think Jerry, you're onto something. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just looked at Amazon life. Like I've heard about it, but this is the first time I've gone to the page and it looks exactly like how it works on Chinese platforms. Literally like you, you go on a lot of the Chinese live streaming apps. I wish I could show you, but like, that's exactly what they're doing. Like, half the live content is people just like literally doing an infomercial for like two hours on products. And the yeah. one Amazon's catching on, which is good because you know, they got to learn from Alibaba. Alibaba yes. is one of the main platforms that was doing this like two to th four years before Amazon was. So Amazon's catching on. That's awesome. We tried to get Amazon to do the, take our app that we developed and build it into their platform. Mm -hmm. And we, we had major conversations with Amazon and the, and for the last three weeks, we've been going over there, um, the color selector and they were asking us for input and, you know, just what was working just because we have, we've had our app out for uh, three years now. Wow. Um, just asking us like what we ran into, what do we think about this? And, you know, so we gave them all the, you know, all of our ideas and all our thoughts on it. And it's, it's literally going to be a game changer in the paint market yeah. because the big paint players won't sell through Amazon. Like Bear, Valspar, Sherwin Williams, Benjamin Moore, they don't want to sell on the Amazon platform because they, they have all these brick and mortar retailers mm -hmm. that they need the foot traffic to go through and they can't change how they sell their paint to consumers. So that's why we developed Prestige Paints because we, we took this stale market that hasn't changed and said, wait a second, what if we change it? What if we make a paint brand that's exclusive on Amazon? So you know, maybe that's, maybe that's their, our big win, Jerry. It's going, it's going pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Three weeks. It'll only benefit you guys and it'll give me something else to do too. So I can, you know, I could be like, Oh, look at these juggling balls. Oh, look at me juggling, you know, stuff like that. I start doing stuff like that. <laughs> I'll tell, I'll tell you what, Jerry, I can't thank you enough. And I kind of mentioned this uh, to you through our Instagram messaging back and forth. The content that you put out there is fresh. It's in the now it's your personality it's, it's energized, just the stretching. I was watching you, like you had me up against, up against the wall doing these stretches because I've had, because I'm hunched over my desk more than I ever have been yeah. staring at my phone with all this remote working. And there's just things that you've been, you've been doing. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie for the first time ever, I watched your commentary on that, uh, those two, the sumo guy in the Indian guy, the Indian uh, version of martial arts. Yeah. I just, I just watched that just the other day and I was completely entertained and I don't know shit about martial <laughs> arts. And you were like literally kind of talking me into understanding what was going on with this mm -hmm. instead of me just kind of jumping in and like going, I don't know what this is and, and flying past it. You're uh, you've got a knack for, for getting people to engage into things. Um, 
that's that's just that's unique. It's it's a it's an amazing skill set. Yeah, thank you. And I I talked to uh, my roommate who helps me a lot on my commentaries. Um, the, the the interesting thing about sort of like what you can call bringing people into a world or teaching is that a lot of times the language has to be sp so specific because if someone like like you say you don't know martial arts right how can you make them understand what's going on and it's just something that i've been trying to break down or how do you explain this right. to everyone you know a lot of people talk about fight commentary breakdowns so they're like jerry man you know you're not the best martial artist why do you have so many subscribers and i tell them well it's because i guess i can communicate to people who don't even do martial arts that's the difference right. between my channel and other channels totally and 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 you're speak and you're speaking in a way that um, I can tell the terminology is there, but you're explaining the terminology um, without making it seem like you're having to teach mm -hmm. me what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, it's just it was very engaging. I watched the whole damn thing, so <laughs> that's <laughs> so awesome. well done. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, guys, this was Jeff Peterson. I've been wanting to have a talk with him for a while, and this gives me reason. The, um, Andy sent me some footage that I could react to that I never did. So now this is the perfect time to kind of overlay some of that footage. Awesome. So, Good you know, stuff. it all worked out in the end, even though it took me, it took me like a year. But That's <laughs> all right. So man. It's, all, it's all good. We've stayed in contact. That's what's yeah. important. Exactly. Um, so for those of you watching, I'm going to put links and everything. And um, for everyone else, um, go follow them every, leave your questions, et cetera, for Jeff, for anyone else at Geneva Supply. And we'll definitely bring Jeff or whoever, um, Jeff, you want us to bring on back. I'm totally down oh, to for bring sure. him on. Um, and the other thing I was going to uh, tell you, Jeff, is um, your students, um, whether they're alumni or current students, but alumni might be interesting too. Like, let's say they're a few years in college or maybe they've yeah. even like started their own business. I mean, they're welcome to come talk to me. Kind of, they can talk about how biz tank influenced them and then what oh, they're doing they, now. They would, there's kids that would love that. Yeah. There's kids so that would absolutely The invitation's love that. out there. I'm sure when I get this video up, I'll probably put this on both fight commentary breakdowns and my personal channel. But like when this is up, I'll just tell them they can totally come on and talk. I, the, the students that initially reached out to me when I came on, yeah. um, I tried to get some of them to talk. I think they, they got a little shy. They didn't want to come on my channel, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a there's a ton of kids that'll that'll do it especially and honestly um through this the whole zoom part of it the kids are getting so used to it this will mm -hmm. be this will be a blast for them cool so sounds I'll good okay um everyone watching i'm gonna stop recording now i'll keep talking with jeff afterwards but jeff thank you so much man very appreciate it buddy